Have you ever looked to the Bible to try to figure out how to have a thriving marriage? Maybe, maybe not, but that's what we're looking at today. My name is Ben. I'm glad you've joined us online today. Jim is doing exactly that. He's going to unpack what the Bible has to say about how to have a thriving marriage. And so if you're currently married or you've been married in the past, or maybe one day you want to be married, then lean in today, not out, because we believe that what the Bible is going to teach us today could change your life, your relationships, and your marriage. Hey, if you haven't already, please follow us on our YouTube channel so that we can get connected to you. We can hopefully be an awesome resource for you as you continue to grow in relationships and grow with Jesus. So we're glad you're here today. Uh, hey, let's jump into this. Over the past couple of months, we have been working our way through one of two letters written by a man named Peter to some people, new Christians who lived in what we now call modern day Turkey. And Peter opens the letter, a quick review, chapter one, we hit back in like September, right? By addressing them as, remember, exiles. Remember this? Exiles living in a world that's not their home. But he also acknowledges that for the foreseeable future, they and we, this is where we are going to live, right? We're going to work here. We're going to go to school here. And, and they're trying to figure out how to live as followers of Jesus in a world, like in a culture where they don't fit in. And we feel like that sometimes, right? And, and, the, and the, the theme of this entire book, all right, it's a letter that becomes a book of our Bible, comes down to one word. And you should have this written on the first page, right? Hope right? Hope. It's all about don't lose hope. Jesus is our living hope. He won't perish. He won't fade. He won't, he won't break down over time. Keeping holding on to Jesus, even when you're going through suffering, and you will, right? He, you, you, you won't lose hope, right? And then that was chapter one. Then chapter two unpacks how we are to live our lives with others around us, especially when our faith and how we choose to live our lives and, and raise our kids and stuff like that. When it, it's in sharp contrast and it collides with the values and the lifestyles of the people that we, that we work and go to school with. We, 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 we are, this is what we learned. We are to use our lives, our time, our ability, our money. We're going to use it different. We have different priorities. We're different than people who don't follow Jesus. And we deliver our lives in such a way that even if people accuse us of doing evil, they won't have anything to point to except that the goodness of our lives calls into question how they're living their lives, and then that'll feel threatening to them, so they'll attack you. Some of us have lived that, right? They'll accuse us, right? They'll try to make us feel weird or old-fashioned or out of touch with the modern world, and they'll try to push us to the side, and they'll force us to be quiet. But here's where we landed. We're not going to be quiet anymore. We will raise and we will protect our children. We will be the primary influence in their understanding of how God created them, not culture, not the school system, not their friends. We are God's people. We're his temple, we're his nation, we're his children, we're his family. This is our time, chapter two, amen? <laughs> then last, we drove into chapter three last week, which is all about how we're gonna live in relationship to the people around us in a world that operates very differently than what God says is right and true and actually works, especially when it comes to the most intimate relationship in our life, our marriage. And last week, we unpacked part one of marriage by looking at wives, and this, this we weren't even talking to men last week, all right? And this week, we'll, in part two, we'll take a look at hubs, husbands. We're not even talking to you ladies today, all right? Take a break, all right? But if we are both, both men and women, if we're willing to listen to God, and follow his instructions. He says that this is possible for two people in a marriage to experience. And here's the list. We're gonna come back to it several times. It says the husband may be one to God. Like the husband will get closer to God when you're living like this. The hidden heart of a wife will be uh, beautiful, right? The wife will never need to be afraid of anything. The marriage will be unified and mutually honoring and fulfilling. Your prayers will not be hindered or cut off. We're gonna look at that today. Jesus will be remembered and God will be pleased. In chapter three last week, it started with this one word. If you have your Bible, go ahead and find 1 Peter chapter three. Chapter three started with this word, likewise. Likewise, and we're gonna come back to it again today, which pointed back to how the previous chapter ended with the description of Jesus setting an example that we should follow his example of submitting and sacrificing ourselves so that the people in our lives have a greater chance of experiencing what God has in mind for them. Jesus did that for you and me. So chapter three began this week, last week, likewise, Wives, are you willing to do that for your husband? And I threw out this statement to, to wives. It goes like this. The best way to have positive influence over your husband's walk with God is to voluntarily place yourself under your husband by treating him with respect. We, we unpacked that last week. If you weren't here, go back and listen to it. Peter is not talking about who's the boss at your house. Answer, Jesus right? Peter's asking wives to partner with God in seeing their husbands grow in their faith and their life with God. So we ended with this question to wives, really to anybody who wants to see a really important relationship in their life go the distance, what would you be willing to do? What would you be willing to submit? 
What would you be willing to sacrifice so that those possible outcome statements all become a reality for this relationship? What would you be willing to do? So we're gonna pick right up where we left off last week. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna skim through this, this little, little paragraph, right? Uh, uh, P- Peter uses Abraham and Sarah, um, this couple that God chose way back at the beginning of the Bible to launch his chosen people. They're a married couple who had, who had faith in God, but honestly, they were really, really flawed people. All right, they messed up in their marriage several times before they got some stuff figured out. But, but Abraham was faithful to God as best as he understood, and, and Sarah stuck with him. Sarah stuck with Abraham. He took her down some wild trails too, right? Some rough stretches, but they never quit. They never gave up on one another, and they never gave up on God. And God kept his promise, and he blessed them, and out of their line comes Jesus. But Peter promises wives, keep your eyes on God, and do what's good, and you won't have to be afraid of anyone or anything. God will take care of you. You can have hope. So now we come to today. Today, Peter is going to turn his attention to husbands. Buckle up, all right? And again, listen, I know that half the men listening to me right now are single. Either you're not married yet or you're not married anymore. You're not married yet because you're 12 or maybe whatever that is, all right? But, but there's a truth in here that's true for all men or like all people. So file this away because what Peter is going to describe here is not something that you go try to figure out after you get married. See, this is... This should be in the Bible too, right? This doesn't change anybody. A a ring, a wedding ceremony doesn't change a person's character, like the kind of person they are. And Peter is going to describe the kind of man that you need to be and become now as a single man so that it describes you should you ever get married or married again. And if you're already married and you're not this kind of man, this is the direction that you need to be like heading towards and developing again if you want those list of outcomes to describe your, your family, your marriage, all right? So here we are in chapter three, verse seven. It says this, okay? Likewise, there it is again, all right? Husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way. So if you have your Bible, under, underline understanding. Now, honestly, Peter could have left out the with your wives part and simply said, men, live your life in a, with this understanding. Because when Peter's referring to, when he uses the word understanding, he's referring to, hey, men, live your entire life in light of or through the lens or through the filter of your understanding of who Jesus is and what he has done and is doing in your life every day. So, so it goes like this. So men, husbands, in light of who Jesus is, in light of who Jesus says that you are, in light of what Jesus has done and is doing in your life, in light of your total dependence upon his grace and mercy for everything, in light of what God has entrusted to your care, provision, and protection, in light of your understanding of all that you know about Jesus, this is how I'm gonna live my life. All the parts of my life. This is how I'm gonna, this is how I'm gonna run my money, my, my body, my sexuality, my family, my parenting, all right? This is how I'm as a fully devoted follower of Jesus. And this is what Peter's talking about. And this is how I will live my life with my wife as a husband who will take care of her out of my understanding of what Jesus is, who Jesus is and how he takes care of me. In other words, my relationship with Jesus will inform how I approach all of my relationships, but at the top of the list, especially my wife. So let's keep, keep going. Let's get into the controversial part. Here we go, right? So live with your wives in an understanding way, showing, here's two words to underline, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel. Now, however the, the husband is going to approach his wife, it will be modeled after or through his understanding of how Jesus would approach his wife. Now, don't jump to a bunch of conclusions based on some words that kind of jump out at you, especially when you, I, I, some of you, are, you're losing your mind, all right? You know, what do you mean weaker, all right? All right? Or the word honor. And here's why I want you to just take a breath. The English language isn't great at capturing the intended meaning that Peter wrote this 2,000 years ago. We just lose it in English. First, let's look at the word honor. Honor is a value statement. Honor is a value statement. In other words, in understanding of who Jesus is, who Jesus says that my wife is, and in understanding and consideration of my role in her life, I will approach her through the honoring value statement that, 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 that she's the weaker vessel. Now, Peter is using a metaphor here, comparing the wife to a weaker vessel. What's that mean? Some of you are going, yeah, what's that mean? All right. Well, don't read weaker as she's not strong or she's not even as strong as him. It doesn't mean that, right? No, I, I know some wives that in a fight, <laughs> my money's on her, all right? I, I, <laughs> right? I, I know some women who could bench press their husbands, all right? So, so it's not about weak physical strength or, or weak in character or weak in any part of, of, of their life. I mean, think about this. How condescending would God have to be to tell a man to take care of his wife because she's too weak to take care of herself? No. 
Peter is continuing the same value statement. The reader back then would have gotten the comparison, but we miss it here in 2022. Back then, a, a weaker vessel would be referring to a, a precious, like one of a kind, very expensive cup or, or, or bowl, okay? Today, we might say like an expensive, delicate, like piece of porcelain china or something like that, right? And she's not, he's not, listen, don't, don't hear fragile, hear valuable, okay? See, what Peter is telling husbands is live with your wife from the perspective of, of who Jesus says she is and what Jesus says your role in her life is. Approach her as, value her as if she was the most expensive, most prized china cup that's been entrusted to you to your care and protection. See, see, this is really expensive, right? This, this I can handle this Yeti tumbler any way I want. This thing is indestructible. You can drop it, you can throw it, you can kick it. I mean, it got get some scratches on it, but you know, dust it off and it's ready to go. Right, you, you, can't, you can't hurt this thing, right? This china cup, on the other hand, all right, uh, if I treat this the same way, I'm not going to, all right, uh, it, it'll shatter. Instead, I pay attention. I'm on the lookout. When I have this in my hand, I'm on the lookout for anything that might bump into it or knock it off the table or, or, or land on it. You, you just, and I'm not even sure if, if you're conscious or not, it, 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 it just is, but it's, you, you're just different when you're drinking from this thing and, and this thing. You just handle it different. It's like, if this is more important, right? So I've, I've shared my, watch me drop it. Uh, I, I've, I've shared my, some of my pieces of my story growing up. But So my dad uh, was a pastor in a little church, and we were living in a little town in Indiana. When, now, when I say little church in a little town in Indiana, what I mean is we were poor. I mean poor, like wrong side of the tracks, government cheese poor. Anybody understand what government cheese even? Thank you, all right, right, right. Anyway, it's not bad. Anyway, anyway, we, we didn't have a lot of nice things, right? We didn't even own our own house. But, but the one thing that my mom really loved was when she got married, my dad gave her a set of china. He worked at this department store in downtown Cincinnati to work his way through college and through his employee discount, he gave her, he gave her like really, really, really nice dishes for, for a wedding present. But I, I remember when I was in junior high, I had this super hyper Irish setter dog, all right? We were buddies and we were running through the house, all right? And, and, and on the kitchen counter, my mom had gotten out her, 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 her wedding china, a few pieces of it, because some ladies from church were coming over for coffee. Well, I'm just tearing through the house and I'm not paying attention. And I come around the corner and I bump into the table and, and somehow, I'm, it's probably the dog's fault. Anyway, I, I launched that sugar bowl uh, across the kitchen floor and it shattered on the floor. And I just looked at my mom and my mom looked at me and we just couldn't breathe. And then, then, then she started crying, right? <laughs> Tears streaming down her face. Not because my mom was materialistic, but because of the emotion behind that, that, that sugar bowl, because of the story behind that sugar bowl. And now because somebody just wasn't paying attention and was careless, wasn't watching what they were doing, it was gone, and you can't replace it. You can't glue it back together. And this is what Peter is warning husbands, pay attention. Plain English, I'm not going to treat or let anybody else treat my wife like she's a Yeti tumbler. I'm not going to, and I'm not gonna let anybody break my wife. I know she can take care of herself. I know she's strong. I know she can defend herself. I know she can hold her own out there. But with me in her life, she shouldn't have to. That's why I'm here. She doesn't have to defend herself from people outside of our family, including our extended family, like our in-laws, all right? Because I'm gonna get between her and anybody who tries to break her. It's okay, babe, I got gotcha. you. She doesn't, she doesn't have to defend herself to our children because I will make it clear the kids will have to go through me if they're gonna try to break her. You will not treat your mom like she's some cheap water bottle for you to disrespect and toss aside when you're finished over my dead body. She doesn't have to defend herself from me because I honor her and I approach her as if the purpose of my life is to love her, which by definition, love means provide and protect because in my understanding of Jesus, that is my purpose. It's my role in Robin's life. And with this understanding, this is how I will live with her. And then Peter makes two outcome statements that result from a husband approaching his wife like this. Again, still talking to husbands, he says, so show honor as a weaker vessel. Since they, the wives, since they are, look at this, heirs with you in the grace of life. You gotta underline that. 
you're just looking at me, underline it right now. Right? Uh, that, this is so cool. This is my favorite part of the whole talk, right? We, we looked at the voluntary decision of a wife to lower herself to a position so that she can support her husband up. I want him to see God, right? And, and today we're looking at a husband taking the, the Jesus-informed position of providing love and protection like, I got gotcha. you. Like, like I'm, I, I got my arms around you like this. And what Peter is painting here is she's coming this way and he's coming this way and they meet in the middle as heirs or co-heirs in the grace of life. Time out. Isn't that beautiful? I, I can't believe that I've, I've read this dozens of times. I've missed that phrase, the grace of life. I can't believe that somebody hasn't written the, the ultimate love song with that line in it. I don't know why this isn't in every wedding ceremony. It will be in the rest of my life when I do them, all right? Can you think of a better phrase, a better description, a better outcome of two people coming together in marriage than looking at one another and living together from the perspective of when God put you and me together, God has given me the grace of life, the kindness of life, the gift of life. Husbands, God is giving you, write this down, the most romantic line possible. Babe, <laughs> your presence in my life is a living, breathing reminder of the grace and goodness of God. <laughs> Mic drop, walk out of the room, right? <laughs> and the understood part is I will live my life with my wife so she looks at me and says my husband's presence in my life is a living, breathing reminder of the grace and goodness of God, all right? And if you're both experiencing that, Boom, go upstairs. That's all I'm saying. I mean, this is, let's go. This is the most romantic, like, this is why we're together. I threw that in. That wasn't in rehearsal. Anyway, so, <laughs> so Peter is reminding husbands, this is your role in the life of your wife. As she was the most precious, like most expensive treasure, you provide all she needs and protect her from anything or anyone would try to break her or take from her what God meant for her to have. And the result would be for both of you to experience grace of life. But then Peter slips in one more statement, not necessarily as a warning, but, but an explanation or, or a reality if the husband doesn't live with his wife in this way. Look at this last line. It's kind of confusing. So that your prayers may not be hindered. You take good care of her. Why? So that your prayers aren't, won't, won't be hindered. And you know what Peter is saying? It's this, and this goes for husbands and wives, but Peter's really leaning into, into the men right now. He, he says this, husbands, you cannot have an intimate relationship with God when you're not pursuing an intimate relationship with your wife. It's impossible. And, yeah, all right, and I can show you a whole bunch of Bible verses where God says, I'm not gonna listen to your prayers. I mean, it's all, it's all through that. I'm not gonna listen to your prayers anymore when you are intentionally neglecting the thing I told you to take care of. And for husbands, number one on that list, above your job, above your children, above yourself, you take her, you love your wife, you provide and protect your wife. Last week I made a statement that I cannot unhitch how Robin and I are getting along with how God and I are getting along. Those relationships, they're just run parallel. If Robin and I are good, God and I are good. If God and I are good, Robin and I are good. And if God and I are at odds and I'm moving away from God to pursue something else, all right, I'm usually doing the same thing with Robin. And if I'm neglecting my relationship with Robin, I promise I'm also neglecting my relationship with God. I don't think it's intentional. I just think that both of them are like thermometers of how the other one's doing. It's, that, it's that, that we are one greater thing that happened when we got married. See, Robin and me and God, the, the three of us are in this thing together. And if I neglect one of the three and expect the other two to be fine, I'm in for a rude awakening. And Peter's saying, men, if you wanna know one of the reasons why you feel disconnected from God, why, why your prayers aren't making it through the ceiling, why they're not making a difference in your life, Maybe it's because whatever you're asking God to do in some part of your life, God's answer is, yeah, we'll get to that, but before we do, let's look at what's going on or not going on between you and your wife, and then we'll get that back on track, and then we'll look at some other things that, are you ready for this, aren't as important to me or to you. Now, here, I'm, a, I'm a guy, I know what's going through our heads. Well, if she was different, if she was different, if God would change her, right? If she would submit to my leadership, then I would lean back into this marriage. Eh, nope. Write this down. You're not the Holy Spirit. Oh. She has her own wrestling match with God. You're not her Holy Spirit. You are her husband. And Peter is telling us husbands, if we want to have any hope of experiencing the grace of life, we move toward her, not away from her. And from that position, God can get involved. I'll say it again, you cannot experience the grace of God when you aren't pursuing the grace of life with your wife. Let me put that in the language of last week. Husbands, God is commanding you to partner with him and seeing your wife have and experience everything that God has in mind for her. And God has given you, the husband, this is heavy, the responsibility as the primary agent 
other than God himself by which she can experience the grace of life. It's on us. So let, let, let me land, kind of land the plane with, I'm not really, uh, but let me, let me be really clear. We're not responsible for our spouse's salvation. That's Jesus. We're not responsible for their sinful choices and behaviors that the other one chooses to do or not do. But as I understand scripture, a day will come when God will examine everyone, each one of us individually, and I believe as a couple and as a family. And while every one of us will give an account for our own lives and choices, I believe that God will start with the man, the husband, the father. He's gonna ask us, guys, he's gonna ask us two questions. What happened and where were you? And I'm not making this up. I see it in the first three chapters of the Bible, right? Adam and Eve had, had equal access to God. They were in touch with God. They were listening to God. They both knew what God had said was right and what was true. They knew what choices led to life. They knew what choices led to death. And they both made a decision to choose to let go of God and do something else. And God's response, he called out to Adam, where are you? Hiding. What happened? And his answer, read this later. The woman that you gave me caused this to happen. That's what he said, all right? The husband's immediate response was blame, her fault. And kind of, God, you're the one who gave her to me, so it's kind of on, on you if you made her different, right? I'm actually the victim here. And then Eve's response is, not my fault, the serpent tricked me, I'm the victim here. And it all falls apart. But how much, how, how different, the story goes so much different if Adam had honored his wife, if he had done the one thing that God said to do, provide and protect his wife from anything and anything, anyone that wanted to hurt her or take something from her. If, how about this, if when temptation came to let go of God and do something else, if Adam had stepped in and said, excuse me, talk to me. If you wanna get to her, you're gonna have to go through me. Instead of, Adam was right there. This happened at his house, all right? Watching it happen, and he did Nothing, no protection, no honor. He was passive, and then he played the victim card, and then he lost everything. I, I don't want, I don't want, none of us signed up for that. None of us want that. It's what some of us are living, but we want something better. So let's go back to the, the, the promised list of, of, uh, of outcomes. If, if, if a wife will partner with God by submitting and sacrificing what is ne whatever is necessary to see her husband experience God's grace, and, and if a husband will partner with God by approaching his wife through the lens of, of who Jesus is and who, who Jesus says she is and the role that he has in her life, so that together they experience the grace of life. And this is a great description of the grace of life. This is what we all want. The husband gets close to God. The, wife of, the, the heart of a wife it just gets more beautiful. The, the wife isn't afraid of anything. The marriage just gets better, unified, honoring, fulfilling. Your prayers are, are, are effective. They get through. You have conversations with God, right? But Jesus will be remembered. And God will be pleased. I, I would like that. So I, I, wanna, I do want to wrap this up. I want to talk to three different groups of people. First, I want to talk to people who aren't married. This might be the best premarital counseling you've ever gotten. And I know you're 13, file it away. This is really important, right? Next generation, right? Just listen, right? You don't become a good man or a good woman or a good person when you meet the right person and get married. Right? A ring and a ceremony might change your legal standing or even your last name. It won't change your character and it won't fix any of your flaws. It will actually expose them. So you will bring all your junk into your dating life and into your married life. You, you're gonna hate this, right? You will be the kind of husband that you were a, a boyfriend. You'll be the kind of wife that you were as a girlfriend, which means this, if you cheat on your boyfriend or girlfriend, if you go after somebody else's boyfriend or girlfriend, you'll do the same thing in marriage. You'll do the same thing with somebody else's marriage because that's the kind of person you are. You're a cheater, it's your character. If you can't control yourself sexually as a single person, you won't control yourself sexually as a married person. Again, a ring doesn't change anything, and after the honeymoon fades, and it will, your life will get tough, and you'll go back to old muscle memories, because that's who you are. If you lie to him or her now, you'll do the same thing in marriage. If you keep secrets now, you'll keep secrets in your marriage. But if you want to experience a marriage that's described as the grace of life, then you have to start becoming a man or woman of grace now. You need to become men and women of integrity now. A person who keeps their word now, who does what they say they're going to do now, every day, you keep your promise. 
You need to practice the discipline of self-control in your emotions, in your sexuality, with your body, with somebody else's body, with, with, with your time, so that when you find yourself in a tough time of temptation, especially after a long stretch of frustration, and life doesn't seem fair, in that moment, you won't have to decide what you're gonna do. Am I gonna compromise or am I gonna bail on my character? You won't even consider that as an option because of the kind of person that you've become. This one's really important. You have to figure out who you are. You have to figure out your identity and your, and your value and your purpose of your life, and you have to get that from God. What God has said is true about you. You cannot get that from your boyfriend. You cannot get that from your girlfriend. You can't get it from a husband or a wife. You can only get it from God. But when you learn that you are, and you learn that from spending a lot of time in God's word, listen, if you'll do that, whoever gets you as a husband or gets you as a wife will get a man or woman of confidence who know who they are, they know they're enough, and they won't have to work it out on you to try to prove it. Some of us were married to that person for a while and they worked out their crap on us. But that has to start like uh, now, before you get in a relationship. See, it, when you go to the gym, the way that you get stronger is to slowly increase the weight over time. And you think there's uh, another way to get there stronger faster, you're gonna get crushed. Not because you're a bad person, you just weren't prepared. So get prepared. Get in God's word, like every day, just a little bit every day. Get in a, get in a small group, student group, young adult group, a college group, be, be at church. I mean, you're here, you're listening, that's awesome. Start training for becoming a great man or woman of God so that you experience the grace of life now, later. Got it? Nod at me, young, nod at me. Okay, all right, good, all right, all right. Group two, I wanna talk to parents, parents of single children, all right? I was doing an interview this past week with Dr. Crawford Loritz uh, for, for a podcast that's gonna come out in the next week or so. And I would say it's the best, it's my favorite interview I've ever been a part of. Dr. Loritz is a great, 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 great man. He's a, he's a great grandson of a slave. He's been president and leader of every major Christian organization that you can think of. He's been a pastor in the Atlanta area for many years and he shares a passion with me uh, for men and husbands and fathers to reach their full potential. And here's what he said, and again, this should be in the Bible, in the book of Proverbs somewhere. Look at this, parents, get this out. You're gonna get your phone out, right? This is so good. The essence of parenting is to be a portrait of the destination. You just gotta let that sink in. The essence of parenting is to be a portrait of the destination. And what he's talking about here is modeling. In other words, whatever I want my children to be, they have to see it, see it in me. If I want my children to be secure and confident and self-controlled, courageous, strong, patient, honest people who keep their word, who show up like they promised they would show up, who don't quit when life gets hard, then they have to see it in you. Because we all swore we'd never repeat our parents' mistakes. And we all have. See, the pressure is not to be perfect. The pressure is to never, ever, 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 ever quit or give up. If you do, they will too. And here's what's going on in a lot of, right, some of us parents, and I put myself in this category, here's what we're thinking right now. Too late. Too late. That boat has sailed. They've already seen me make a lot of mistakes, make bad decisions. They've already experienced my temper. They've seen me quit. They saw me walk, walk out. Okay, I, I have some of those in my life too. But you're still here. I'm still here. They're still here, okay? And it's not too late to write the next chapter of your life. Let's title this one, Watch Me Get Back Up. Watch me turn this thing around. Watch me become the husband, the dad, the mom, the wife, whatever, that, that I wasn't, but by the grace of God, I am becoming. And even if they don't acknowledge it because they're mad at you, they'll see it. They'll file it away and down the road when they make their share of mistakes. And they will. They'll remember that their mom or dad made some changes in their life. And maybe it'll help them get up when they fall down. Let's go back to what Nate said earlier. It's not too late. It's never too late. Parents, this is the only thing I want you to hear today. By the grace of God, you can be forgiven for the past. By the same grace of God, you can experience the grace of life in the future. It's gonna take a lot of grace. Third group of people, those of us who are married, but it's not going well. So here's what I know is happening, right? And this one's a hard one for me. You've been listening these past two weeks and you felt everything from sadness because your marriage doesn't feel anything like what Peter's been describing. And some of us, we're just angry, all right? Our marriage is so broken or he or she, or she is so frustrating and you're thinking, this can't be fixed. It's a matter of time till he or she taps out. This is where some of us are, okay? Let's listen, right? I don't know if your marriage can be saved. I do know this. It doesn't stand a chance 
unless both of you change your minds about one another and about this marriage. I'll I'll try to explain with a story which won't line up with your story, but I think that you can take some of my examples and then put your own in, and when I get to the end, God will tell you what you need to do in your case, all right? So over the past couple weeks in here, I have used my relationship with Rob and my wife as an illustration of this is what it looks like to run after intimacy with God and with another person, with one another, all right? Sometimes I I hesitate to use Rob and I, us, all right, uh, as an illustration because I'm afraid that you'll think I'm trying to portray ourselves as some perfect problem-free marriage that we just sit around our house and read the Bible and rewatch The Chosen or something, all right? We're, we're not that couple. I've never even watched The Chosen. Anyway, so, so some of you know the bigger story of, of our lives, but a lot of you are new. So shortly after our second child, Jordan, was born, uh, Robin was really depressed, and we thought it was postpartum, but she was diagnosed as a bi- bipolar disorder. It was about 33, 35 years ago. I would say that for most of our time living in Louisville, Kentucky, definitely most of our kids' elementary school years, uh, Robin was out, out of the game. Her brain chemistry, and some of you live this, right? It was a, it was a roller coaster ride. I mean, all over the place. Or you couldn't get meds figured out. Everything, every time we thought we had meds figured out, then they would change, then we have to go back again. And it was just, I'm sorry. She, uh, here we go. She tried. She's so strong. She tried to be a mom, but she missed a lot of our kid's life. Uh, She tried to be a wife, but it's tough. She tried to stay alive. More than once, I came home and found her between the bed and the wall, banging her head against the wall, asking God to just kill her. She actually looked at me and said, everybody's life would be better if I wasn't here. And I'd say, that's not true, babe. But on the inside, sometimes I'll be honest with you, I'll be like, well, we were barely hanging on. Except on Sunday, I had to go to church and be Pastor Jim and smile and tell people to trust Jesus and the sun will come out tomorrow. But, but honestly, it was really hard to trust Jesus in that season. I, some days, I didn't even like him. And my prayers were like this. I, come on, Jesus, I'm on your side. I'm on your team, all right? All right, is this how you treat your friends? But I couldn't say that out loud because what would people like you think about Pastor Jim? Anyway, after about a decade of this, Robin hit a season where she stabilized, all right? So uh, less, less highs, manic, and less lows, less, less time curled up in the field position in our, in our bedroom. So she, she started re-entering the life of our family. She started speaking up as to how things should go around the house. And, and you know what it felt like? Intrusive. Whoa, 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 time out. You checked out. I've done everything. I had to cook, clean, carpool, shop, do laundry, get kids to games, to the doctor, and I have this job that I have to figure out to get, to get done. And now Robin wanted to step back in and move, move, move forward, and I got angry. See, you can't get angry at a sick person because they're sick, but now you're not as sick, let's go, right? And all that pinup, undealt with anger came gushing out. I ended up in anger management counseling. The counselor said, Jim, you're angry. I'm not angry, I'm a Christian. <laughs> My counselor said I'm a stuffer. <laughs> like, I, like I take all my anger, all my frustration, and because I'm supposed to be a good Christian, I put it in a closet and then close the door, but a day comes when someone, usually one of my kids, does one small thing and the closet door explodes and they get an avalanche, lands on them and crushes them. It's so unfair. Anyway, one day Rob and I were going at it. And another thing, and another thing, and another thing. I remember storming out, getting in my car. I drove her to my office, I called her, and another thing. And then I hung up on her. (laughs) Husband of the year. When When I got home later that night after church, all right, it started up again. We're going back and forth. Yeah, well, you and you and you, right? And then Robin, Robin looked at me. She looked at me, and she looked like she weighed about 10 pounds. She's tiny. Her shoulders all down and defeated. She looked at me and goes, I'm sorry. And I knew what she meant. She wasn't saying, I'm sorry for this fight. She was saying, I'm sorry I ruined your life. She didn't. She just felt it. But what she was asking is this, I can't change this. I can't change the past. Can you just forgive me? And I had a choice. I said, yes or no. That's the only options, yes or no. And this moment would define our family's future. Would I forgive her? And I know some of you are saying, there's nothing to forgive. She was sick. That's not her fault. I I know. But we were exhausted. 
The question wasn't, would I forgive her for being sick? The question is, would I extend grace to my wife who I had looked at several years before and I made a promise to her for worse, for sickness, for poor, till death do us part, I'm not going anymore, anywhere. And then I said, yes. I gave her grace and then I asked for grace in my direction for being a jerk. She made sure I put that in there. Um, See, me being a jerk, that's not her fault. I had just taken, out, taken it all out on her, which means the hero of the story, the only hero in this story is the grace of God. Jesus, our living hope, is the only hero in any of our stories. I, I, I don't know what's going on in your marriage or your family or with your parents or with your kids. I just know this. If we don't start giving out and asking for more and more grace, it is a matter of time till it's over and they're gone. I also know this, whatever is going on at your house is not gonna fix itself. It doesn't work that way. And it's gonna take more than a conversation this afternoon and some prayer, although it might take that and a lot more. You're gonna have to start doing some things different than what you've been doing, because what you've been doing got you here. Something's gotta change. You're gonna have to go talk to somebody, a counselor, together or, or separately, this week, okay? Just when you get in the car this week, look at each other and go, and let's call the care ministry at, at, at Flatirons and, and see where they can point us. We have a team ready to walk you through this. After church, just come down and, and get some prayer. You're gonna have to start doing some new things and it will feel weird and awkward because there'll be new muscle memories. You're gonna have to stop doing some old things because they are competing with and pulling you away from one another and there's not room for that and your marriage. One of them's gotta go. It's gonna be really, really hard. Trust me, I'm, I rewrote this whole talk Friday. I'm sitting at my table and I have tears streaming down my face because I'm just remembering how, how crappy it was. And still is, that's bipolar, right? But I, I promise, it doesn't matter what I promise. Jesus makes us a promise if we'll keep going if we keep asking for and handing out grace from God and to one another, it will be worth it. And there's no other way. There's no other way to get there, to experience the grace of life with the people that we love. I changed the last song. They love it when I do that. It's a song about grace, but it's not like amazing grace. It's like we, we need a boatload of grace. The song has like, I need the whole gates of heaven to open up and pour out grace on this or we're not gonna make it. So swing wide, all you heavens. And fill our life with good grace. Let's stand up. Let me pray for three groups of people. God, I pray for those who are trying to figure out life on the front end of I don't know if they're gonna get married or who they're gonna get married. I, I don't know what they think about themselves. I don't know what they, their past contains. I just know, like they said earlier, just one day at a time, one day at a time, I lean on God's grace to get me to where I need to be. So I pray for, for those who are in a world that says sexuality is nothing, and relationships are nothing, and you can, you, can, you can treat them like throwaways, you can treat people like throwaways. God, will you turn these young men and women, or these single young men, men and women, we turn them into men and women of God, because somewhere out in the world right now is the person that you're gonna join them with and, and prepare them to take good care of that person. God, I pray for parents who are struggling with the like, we, we haven't done it right, we made a mistake. If we knew now what we know now, if we would've known that then, then maybe we'd made different. Well, we didn't. The past is the past, so grace covers the past. But God, will you give them the strength and the courage that from now on, they'll have a conversation that might start with their children, I'm sorry. I'm sorry you had to see that. I'm sorry you had to watch that. But please know that I, I'm your dad and I've I'm, got my eyes on Jesus. I'm your mom. i got my eyes on Jesus. God, for any relationship right now that's listening to my voice, that's going, I don't know if I can do this anymore. I, I don't want to get sappy. I just, I, I just, will you heal them? Will you restore them? 
You'll give each one of them grace and give them enough grace that they can actually extend it to the other person. God, you're the God of resurrection. You can even take dead relationships and bring them back to life. It's what you do. So I ask for that miracle of resurrection in somebody's life today. I ask for a miracle so that you get all the credit and all the glory so we can live the grace of life. In Jesus' name, I pray, amen. Hey, thanks for joining us at Flatirons Church Online. We create new content all the time, including a live stream every Sunday. So you're not gonna wanna miss anything. Subscribe to our channel. And if you'd like to continue to support us in reaching people in a lost and broken world, go ahead and hit that Give Now button. Thanks again for joining us, and we'll see you next Sunday.